Chapter Seven. Their Yesterdays by Harold Bell Wright. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Temptation. The heights of life are fortified. They are guarded by narrow passes where the world must go single file, and where, if one slip from the trail, he falls into chasms of awful depths, by cliffs of apparent impassable abruptness which, if in scaling, one loses head he is lost, and by false trails that seem to promise easy going, but lead in the wrong direction. Not in careless ease are those higher levels gained. The upward climb is one of strenuous effort, of desperate struggle, of hazardous risk. Only those who prove themselves fit may gain the top. Somewhere in the life of every man there is a testing time. There is a trial to prove of what metal he is made. There is a point which, won or lost, makes him winner or loser in the game. There is a temptation that to him is vital. To pray, lead us not into temptation, is divine wisdom, for temptation lies in wait. There is no need to seek it. And once it is met, there is no dodging the issue or shifting the burden of responsibility. In the greatest gifts that men possess are the seeds which, if grown and cultivated, yield poisonous fruit. In the very forces that men use for greatest good are the elements of their own destruction. And whatever the guise in which temptation comes, the tempter is always the same. Self. Temptation spells always the mastery of, or the surrender to, oneself. Once I stood on a mighty cliff with the ocean at my feet. Far below, the waves broke with a soothing murmur that scarce could reach my ears, and the gray gulls were playing here and there like shadows of half-forgotten dreams. In the distance, the fishing boats rolled lazily on the gentle swell, and the sunlight danced upon the surface of the sea. Then, as I looked, on the far horizon the storm chieftain gathered his clans for war. I saw the red banners flashing. I watched the hurried movements of the dark and threatening ranks. I heard the rumbling tread of the tramping feet. And, like airy messengers sent to warn me, the gusts of wind came racing and wailed and sobbed about the cliff because I would not heed their warning. The startled boats in the offing spread their white wings and scurried to the shelter of their harbor nests. The gray gulls vanished. The sunlight danced no more upon the surface of the sea. And then, as the battlefront rolled above my head, the billows, lashed to fury by the wind, and flinging in the air the foam of their own madness, came rushing on to try their strength against the grim and silent rock. Again and again they hurled their giant forms upon the cliff, until the roar of the surf below drowned even the thunder in the clouds above, and the solid earth trembled with a shock. But their very strength was their ruin, and they were dashed in impotent spray from the stalwart object of their assault. And at last, when the hours of the struggle were over, when the storm soldiers had marched on to their haunts behind the hills, when the gulls had returned to their sport, and the sun shone again on the waters, I saw the bosom of the ocean rise and fall, like the breast of an angry child exhausted with its passion, while the cliff, standing stern and silent, seemed to look, with mingled pride and piety, upon its foe, now moaning at its feet. Like that cliff, I say, is the soul of a man who, in temptation, gains the mastery of himself. The storm clouds of life may gather darkly over his head, but he shall not tremble. The lightning of the world's wrath and the thunder of man's disapproval shall not move him. The waves of passion that so try the strength of men shall be dashed in impotent spray from his stalwart might. And when, at last, the storms of life are over, when the sun shines again on the waters as it shone before the fight began, he shall still stand, calm and unmoved, master of himself and men. Because those things are true, I say, that temptation is one of the thirteen truly great things of life. And the man knew these things, knew them as well as you know them. In the full knowledge of these things he came to his testing time. To win or to lose, in the full knowledge of all that victory or defeat meant to him, he went to his temptation. It was early winter when his time came, but he knew that first morning after he had returned from his vacation that it was coming. The moment he entered the room to take up again the task of putting his dreams into action, he saw her, and felt her power, for she was one of those women who compel recognition of their sex as the full noonday sun compels recognition of its light and heat. An hour later her duties brought her to him, and for a few moments they stood face to face, and the man, while he instructed her in the work that she was to do, felt the strength of her power, even as a strong swimmer feels the current of the stream. Through her eyes, in her voice, in her presence, this woman challenged the man, made him more conscious of her than of his work. The subtle, insinuating, luring strength of her beat upon him, enveloped him, thrilled him. As she turned to go back to her place, his eyes followed her, 
and he knew that he was approaching a great crisis in his life. He knew that soon or late he would be forced into a battle with himself, and that tremendous stakes would be at issue. He knew that victory would give him increased power, larger capacity, and a firmer grip upon the enduring principles of life, or defeat would make of him a slave, with enfeebled spirit, humiliated and ashamed. Every day in the weeks that followed the man was forced to see her, to talk with her, to feel her strength. And every day he felt himself carried irresistibly onward toward the testing that he knew must come. He was conscious, too, that the woman also knew and understood, and that it pleased her so to use her power. She willed that he should feel her presence. In a thousand subtle forms she repeated her challenge. In ways varied without number she called to him, lured him, led him. To do this seemed a necessity to her. She was one of those women whose nature seemed to demand this expression of themselves. Instinctively she made all men with whom she came in contact feel her power, and instinctively, unconsciously perhaps, she gloried in her strength. If the man could have had other things in common with her, it would have been different. If there had been, as well, the appeal of the intellect, of the spirit, if the beauty of her had been to him an expression of something more than her sex, if it had been ideals, hopes, longings, fears, even sorrow or regret common to both, it would have been different. But there was nothing. Often the man sought to find something more, but there was nothing. So he permitted himself to be carried onward by a current against which, when the time should come, he knew he would need to fight with all his might. And always, as the current swept him onward toward the point where he must make the decisive struggle, he felt the woman's power over him growing ever greater. At last it came. It was Saturday. The man left the place where he worked earlier than usual, that he might walk to his rooms, for he felt the need of physical action. He felt a strong desire to run, to leap, to use his splendid muscles that throbbed and exulted with such vigorous life. As he strode along the streets, beyond the business district, he held his head high. He looked full into the faces of the people he met with a bold, challenging look. The cool, bracing air of early winter was grateful on its glowing skin, and he drank long, deep breaths of it, as one would drink an invigorating tonic. Every nerve and fiber of him was keenly, gloriously alive with the strength of his splendid manhood. Every nerve and fiber of him was conscious of her, and exulted in that which he had seen in her eyes when she had told him that she would be at home that evening and that she would be glad to have him call. With all his senses abnormally alert, he saw and noted everything about him, a thousand trivial, commonly unseen things, along his way, and in the faces, dress, and manner of the people whom he met caught his eye. Yet always, vividly before him, was the face of her whose power he had felt. Under it all, he was conscious that this was his testing time. He knew, or it would have been no temptation, it would have been no trial, Impatiently he glanced at his watch and, as he neared the place where he lived, quickened his stride, springing up the steps of the house at last with a burst of eager haste. In the front hall, at the foot of the stairs, the little daughter of his landlady greeted him with shouts of delight and, with the masterful strength of four feminine years, dragged him, a willing captive, through the open door to her mother's pleasant sitting-room. She was a beautiful, dainty little miss, with hair and eyes very like that playmate of the man's yesterday's and it was his custom to pay tribute to her charms in the coin of childhood, as faithfully and as regularly as he paid his board. Seated now, with the baby on his lap and the smiling mother looking on, he produced, after the usual pretense of denial and long search through many pockets, the weekly offering. And then, as though some guardian angel willed it so, the little girl did a thing that she had never done before. Putting two plump and dimpled arms about his neck, she said gravely, "'Mama don't like me to kiss folks, you know,' "'but she said she wouldn't care if I kissed you.' "'Whereupon a sweet little rosebud mouth "'was offered trustingly, with loving innocence, to his lips. "'A crimson flame flushed the man's face. "'With a laugh of embarrassment and a quick impulsive hug "'he held the child close and accepted her offering. "'Then he went quickly upstairs to his room. "'It was some time later when the man began to prepare for the evening "'to which he looked forward with such eagerness, "'and all his fierce and driving haste was gone.' The mad tumult of his manhood's strength was stilled. He moved, now, with a purpose, sullen, grim, defiant. The fight was on. While he was still vividly conscious of the woman whose compelling power he felt, he felt, now, as well, the pure touch of those baby lips. While he still saw the light in the woman's eyes and sensed the meaning of her smile, 
he saw and sensed as clearly the loving innocence that had shown in the little girl's face as it was lifted up to his. Upon his manhood's strength lay the woman's luring spell. Upon his manhood the baby's kiss lay as a seal of sacredness. Upon his lips it burned as a coal of holy fire. The fight was on. The man's life was not at all an easy life. Besides his work and his memories, there was little to hold him true. Since that day when he stood face to face with life and, for the first time, knew that he was a man, he had been, save for a few friends among the men of his own class, alone. The exacting demands of his work had left him little time or means to spend in seeking social pleasures, or in the delights of fellowship with those for whose fellowship he would have cared, even had the way to their society been, at that period of his life, open to him. He told himself always that sometime in the future, when he had worked out still farther his dreams, he would find the way to the social life that he would enjoy, but until then he must of necessity live much alone. And now, now, the testing time, the crisis in his life had come. Even as it must come to every man who knows his manhood, so it had come to him. The man was not deceived. He knew the price he would pay in defeat. But even while he knew this, even while he knew what defeat would mean to him, so great was her power that he went on making ready to go to her. With the kiss of the little girl upon his lips, he made ready to go to the woman. It was as though he had drifted too far, and the current had become too strong for him to turn back. Thus do such men yield to such temptations. Thus are men betrayed by the very strength of their manhood. With mad determination he awaited the hour. Uneasily he paced his room. He tried to read. He threw himself into a chair only to arise and move about again. Every few moments he impatiently consulted his watch. At every step in the hall, without his door, he started as if alarmed. He became angry in a blind rage with the woman, with himself, and even with the little girl. At last, when it was time to go, he threw on his overcoat, took his hat and gloves, and, with a long, careful look about the room, laid his hand on the door. He knew that the man who was going out that evening would not come back to his room the same man. He knew that that man could never come back. He felt as though he was giving up his apartments to a stranger. So he hesitated, with his hand upon the door, looking long and carefully about. Then quickly he threw open the door, and down the hall and down the stairs, went as one who has counted the cost, and determined recklessly. The man had opened the front door, and was about to pass out when a sweet called, "'Wait! Oh, wait!' Turning, he saw a tiny figure in white flying toward him. The little girl, all ready for bed, had caught sight of him and, for the moment, had escaped from her mother's attention. The man shut the door and caught her up. Two dimpled arms went around his neck, and the rosebud mouth was lifted to his lips. Then the mother came and led her away while the man stood watching her as she went. Would he ever dare touch those baby lips again, he wondered. Could he? he asked himself. Could he face again those baby eyes? Could he ever again bear the feeling of that soft little body in his arms? At the farther end of the hall she turned, and, seeing him still there, waved her hand with a merry call, "'Good-bye! Good-bye!' Then she passed from his sight, and, in the place of this little girl of rosy, dimpled flesh, the startled man saw a dainty maiden of his yesterdays, standing under a cherry-tree with fallen petals of the delicate blossoms in her wayward hair, and with eyes that looked at him very gravely and a little frightened as, for the shaggy-coated minister, he spoke the solemn words, I pronounce you husband and wife, and anything that God has done must never be done different by anybody for ever and ever. Amen. By some holy magic the kiss of the little girl became the kiss of his play wedding wife of the long ago. Very slowly the man went up the stairs again to his room, there to spend the evening not as he had planned, when he was in the mastering grip of self, but safe in the quiet harbor of the yesterdays, where the storms of life break not or are felt only in those gentle ripples that scarce can stir the surface of the sea. The fierce passion that had shaken the very soul of him passed on, as the storm clouds pass. In the calm of the days that were gone, he rested, as one who has fought a good fight, and safe from out the turmoil and the danger, has come victoriously into the peace that passeth all understanding. In the sweet companionship of his childhood mate, with the little girl who lived next door, the man found again that night, his better self. In the boy of the long ago he found again his ideals of manhood. In his yesterdays he found strength to stand against the power of the temptation that assailed him. Blessed, blessed yesterdays. 
It was the time of the first snow when, again, the woman sat alone in her room before the fire, with her door fast locked and the shades drawn close, even as on the other night, the night when her womanhood began in dreams. In the soft dusk, while the shadows of the flickering light came and went upon the walls, and the quiet was broken only by the tick, tick, tick of the timepiece, held in the chubby arms of the fat Cupid on the mantel, the woman sat very still. Face to face with her temptation, she sat alone and very still. For several months the woman had seen her testing time approaching, that day when, looking into her eyes, the man of authority had so kindly bidden her leave her work for the afternoon, she had known that this time would come. In the passing week she had realized that the day was approaching when she must decide both for him and for herself. She had not sought to prevent the coming of that day. She had knowingly permitted it to come. She was even pleased, in a way, to watch it drawing near. Not once in those weeks had he failed to be very kind, or ceased to make her feel that he understood. In a thousand ways, as their work called them together and gave opportunity, he had told her, in voice and look and the many ways of wordless speech, that the time was coming. He had been very careful, too, very careful, that, in their growing friendship, the world should have no opportunity to misjudge. And the woman, seeing his care, was grateful, and valued his friendship the more. So had come at last that Saturday when, with low-spoken words, at the close of the day's work, he had asked if he might call upon her the following evening, saying gravely, as he looked down into her face, that he had something very important to tell her. And she had gravely said that he might come, while her blushes to him confessed that she knew what it was of importance that he would say. Scarcely had she reached her home that afternoon when a messenger boy appeared with a great armful of roses and, as she arranged the flowers on her table, burying her face again and again in their fragment coolness, she had told herself that tomorrow, when he asked her to cross with him the threshold of that old, old door, she would answer, yes. But even as she so resolved, she had been conscious of something in her heart that denied the resolution of her mind. And so it was that, as she sat alone before her fire that night, she knew that she was face to face with the crisis in her life. So it was that she had come to the testing time, and knew that she must win or lose alone. In the sacred privacy of her room, with the perfume of his roses filling the air, and the certainty that when he came on the morrow she must answer, she looked into the future to see, if she might, what it held for her and for him, if she should cross with him the threshold of that old, old door. He was a man whose love would honor any woman, this she knew, and he was a man of power and influence in the world, a man who could provide for his mate a home of which any woman would be proud to be the mistress. Nor could she doubt his love, for nothing else could have persuaded such a man to ask of a woman that which he was coming to ask of her. Beginning with her answer on the following evening, the woman traced, in thought, all that would follow. She saw herself leaving the life that she had never desired, because it could not recognize her womanhood, and, in fancy, received the congratulations of her friends. She lived, in her imagination, those busy days when she would be making ready for the day that was to come. Very clearly she pictured to herself the wedding. It would be a quiet wedding, she told herself, but as beautiful and complete as cultured taste and wealth could make it. Then they would go away for a time, to those cities and lands beyond the sea that, all her life, she had longed to visit. When they returned, it would be to that beautiful old home of his family, the home that she had so often in passing admired. And in that home, so long occupied by him alone, she would be the proud mistress. And then, then would come her children, their children, and so all the fulfillment of her womanhood's dreams. But the woman's face, as she looked into a future that seemed as bright as ever a woman dared to dream, was troubled. As she traced the way that lay so invitingly before her, this woman, who knew herself to be a woman, was sad. Her heart still was as an empty room, a room that is furnished and ready, but without a tenant. Deep within her woman heart she knew that this man was not the one for whom she waited by the open door. She did not know who it was for whom she waited. She knew only that this man was not the one. And she wished, oh, how she wished that this was not so. Because of her longing, because of the dreams of her womanhood, because of her empty heart, she was resolved to cross with this man, who was not the man for whom she waited, the threshold that she could not cross alone. Honor, regard, respect, the affection of a friend she could give him, did give him, indeed. But she knew that this was not enough for a woman to give the man with him she would enter that old, old door. Rising, the woman went to her mirror to study long and carefully the face and form that she saw reflected there. 
she saw in the glass a sweet, womanly beauty, expressing itself in the color and tone of the clean-carved features, in the dainty texture of the clear skin and soft brown hair, in the rounded fullness and graceful lines of the finely molded body. Perfect physical strength and health was there, vital, glowing, appealing, and culture of mind, trained intelligence, thoughtfulness, was written in that womanly face. And with it all there was good breeding, proud blood, with gentleness of spirit. This woman knew that she was well equipped to stand by this man's side, however high his place in life. She was well fitted to become the mistress of his home and the mother of his children. She had guarded well the choicest treasures of her womanhood. She had squandered none of the wealth that was committed to her. She had held it all as a sacred trust, to be kept by her for that one with whom she would go through the old, old door. And she had determined that, tomorrow evening, she would give herself, with all the riches of her womanhood, to this one who could give her, in return, the home of her dreams. While her heart was still as an empty room, she had determined to cross with this man, the threshold over which no woman may again return. Turning from her mirror, slowly the woman went to the great bunch of roses that stood upon her table. They were his roses, and they fitly expressed, in their costly beauty, the life that he was coming to offer to her. Very deliberately she bent over them, burying her face in the mass of rich color, inhaling deeply their heavy fragrance. Thoughtfully she considered them, and all that, to her, they symbolized. But there was no flush upon her cheek now. There was no warmth in the light of her eyes. No glad excitement thrilled her. There was no trembling in her touch, no eager joyousness in her manner. Suddenly, some roisterer, passing along the street with his companions, laughed a loud, reckless, half-drunken laugh that sounded in the quiet darkness with startling clearness. The woman sprang back from the flowers as though a poisonous serpent, hidden in their fragrant beauty, had struck her. With a swift look of horror on her white face, she glanced fearfully about the room. Again the laugh sounded, this time farther down the street. The woman sank into her chair, trembling with a nameless fear. To her, that laugh in the dark had sounded as the laughter of the crowd that day, when she was forced so close to the outcast women who were in the hands of the police. "'But those women,' argued the frightened woman with herself, "'sell themselves to all men for a price.' "'And you,' answered the heart of her womanhood, "'and you, also, will sell yourself to one man for a price. "'The wealth of womanhood committed to you, "'all the treasures that you have guarded so carefully. "'You will now sell to this good man for the price that he can pay. "'If he could not pay the price, "'if he came to you empty-handed,' Would you say yes? But I will be true to him, argued the woman. I will give myself to him, and him only, as wife to husband. You are being false to him already, replied her woman heart, for you are selling yourself, not giving yourself to him. You are planning to deceive him. You would make him think that he has taken to himself a wife, when, for a price, you are selling to him, something higher than a public woman, it is true, but something as true, very much lower than a wife. Whatever matter whether the price be in gold and silver, or in property and social position, it is a price. Except he pay you your price, he could not have you. And what, thought the woman, what if, after she had crossed the threshold with this good man, after she had entered with him into the life that lay on the other side that door, what if then that other one should come? What if the one for whom her empty heart should have waited were to come, and stand alone before that door, through which she could not go back? And the children, the dear children of her dreams, what of them? Had not her unborn children the right to demand that they be born in love? And if she should say no to this man, if she should turn once more away from the open door through which he would ask her to go with him, what then? What if that one who had delayed his coming so long should never come? And then the woman, who knew herself to be a woman, saw the lonely years come and go. While she waited without the door that led to the life of her womanhood's dreams, she saw the beauty that her mirror revealed slowly fading, saw her firm, smooth cheeks become thin and wrinkled, her bright eyes grow dim and pale, her soft brown hair turn thin and gray, her body grow lean and stooped. All the wealth of her womanhood that she had treasured with such care she saw become as dust, worthless. All the things of her womanhood she would be forced to spend in that life that denied her womanhood, and then, when she had nothing left, she would be cast aside as a worn-out machine, never to know the joy of using her womanhood never to have a home, never to feel the touch of a baby hand, to lay down the wealth of her woman life and go empty and alone in her shriveled old age. With an exclamation, the woman sprang to her feet and stretched out her arms. No, 
"'No, no,' she whispered fiercely. "'Anything, anything but that. "'I will be true to him. "'I will be a faithful wife. "'He shall never know. "'He shall not feel that he has cheated. "'And perhaps,' she dropped into her chair again "'and buried her face in her hands as she whispered, "'perhaps, by and by, God will let me love him. "'Surely God will let me love him, by and by.' Some time later, the woman did a strange thing. Going to her desk, softly, as a thief might go, she unlocked a drawer and took from it a small jewel case. For several moments she stood under the light, holding the little velvet box in her hand unopened. Then, lifting the lid, she looked within, and presently, from among a small collection of trinkets that had no value save to her who knew their history, took a tiny brass ring. Placing the box on the dresser, she tried, musingly, to fit the little ring on her finger. On each finger, in turn, she tried, but it would only go part way on the smallest one, and she smiled sadly to see how she had grown since that day under the cherry tree. Turning again, she went slowly across the room to the fire that was now a bed of glowing coals. For a little she stood looking down into the fire. Then, slowly, she stretched forth her hand to drop the ring. But she could not do it. She could not. Returning the little circle of brass to its place among the trinkets in the jewel-box, the woman prepared for bed. The timepiece in the arms of the fat Cupid ticked loudly now, in the darkness, that was only faintly relieved by the glowing embers of the fire. With sleepless eyes the woman who had determined to give herself without love lay staring into the dusk. But she did not see the darkness. She did not see the grotesque and ghostly objects in the gloom. Nor did she see the somber shadows that came and went as the dying fire gained fitful strength. The woman saw the bright sun shining on the meadows and fields of the long ago. She saw again the scenes of her childhood. Again, as she stood under the cherry tree that showered its delicate blossoms down with every puff of air, she looked with loving confidence into the face of the brown-cheeked boy who spoke so seriously those childish vows. Again, upon her lips, she felt that kiss of the childhood mating. The soft light of the fire grew fainter and fainter as the embers slowly turned to ashes. Could it be that the woman, in her temptation, would that the sacred fire of love burn altogether out? Must the memories of her yesterdays turn to ashes, too? The last faint glow was almost gone when the woman slipped quickly out of her bed and, in the darkness, groped her way across the room to the desk where she found the little jewel case. And I think that the fat Cupid who was neglecting his bows and arrows to wrestle with time must have been pleased to see the woman, a little later, when the dying fire flared out brightly for a moment, lying fast asleep, while upon the little finger of the hand that lay close to her smiling lips there was a tiny circle of brass. End of section 7